Inskode. Hi, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, during this presentation, we're going to be telling you a little bit more about stony coral tissue loss disease, what impact it might have, and what we can do to protect Bonaire's reefs. So before we begin, some basic housekeeping. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to post them in the chat and we will answer your questions at the end of our presentation. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, but first, we're going to go through a short introduction where we're going to tell us a little bit more about us. Then we're going to talk a little bit about coral reefs and disease. So what are corals exactly? What is disease? What is bleaching? What is predation? How do you differentiate between these? And we're going to talk a little bit about the first regional outbreak of a disease in the Caribbean. After that, we're going to talk about stony coral tissue loss disease. So what is it? What causes it? How does it spread? What are the possible interventions that are being used in the region to try and mitigate this disease? And lastly, we're going to talk about how we can protect Bonaire's reefs. So first, who are we? My name is Roxanne, and I am one of the biologists of Sinapa. And I would also like to introduce to you our marine park manager, who is also joining us today. Hi, my name is Judith, and I've been managing the marine park for over a year now with the help of a great team. We are here today to speak about stony coral tissue loss disease, which we think could be a potential threat for our reefs. Um, I thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us and to listen to us and to learn a little bit about this uh, disease. Um, I'm going to give the word back to our biologist, Roxanne, who is going to start the actual presentation now. So, before we begin, what is it that Stinapa does? So Stinapa is the National Parks Authority. This means that we have been mandated by the government to manage and protect Bonaire's two parks. These are the Bonaire National Marine Park, which extends from the high water mark all the way to 60 meters depth, so pretty much the entire coastline of our island, as well as the islet of Klein Bonaire and Lac Bay. In our parks, you will find beautiful fringing reefs, mangrove areas, seagrass, and a whole variety of life. We also manage the Washington Slagbay Park, Bonaire's terrestrial park, that covers about 18% of our island, where we have our tropical dry forest, some nesting flamingos, a whole lot of loras, and a lot more. So what is it that we do? We manage these areas, so we have to make sure that the resources we have are protected and used sustainably and fairly for everybody. And we also want to conserve and protect the incredible diversity of life you can find in our parks. And then lastly, why are we here today? So we want to talk about stony coral tissue loss disease. This disease is incredibly worrying, it's spreading really fast, and we need Bonarians and all, our, uh, all the tourists and all our visitors to be prepared for how we can deal with this disease if it does arrive here and how we prevent it from getting here in the first place. So before we talk about disease, let's talk about corals. When we talk about reef building corals, we usually mean hard corals. So these are the really big corals that make huge skeletons composed of calcium carbonate that make the habitat, the foundation of our reefs. Uh, each coral, so each boulder or structure you see is called a coral colony. And a coral colony is actually comprised of millions of little polyps that have internal organs. So they have tentacles, they have a mouth, they have a stomach. And with these little tentacles, they can filter food out of the water column to feed themselves. We have about 45 different species of Caribbean corals. Not all of them occur everywhere, and not all of them are equally abundant. So some of them we see a lot more of, some of them are incredibly rare. So each colony is not just an animal, it's also a system in and on itself. So a coral colony has, within its tissue, these really tiny unicellular algae. And these algae are really important for the coral. They are what give it its color. These algae also photosynthesize, so they use sunlight to make energy. And the energy that they make, they then pass on to the coral colony so that they can survive. So without these algae, most corals can't survive for very long. 
a coral also has its own internal system of bacteria, kind of like we have in our guts, and this microbiome helps keep the coral healthy and also helps protect it against disease. And lastly, we have a whole host of other organisms, so think of fungi, protists, that also live on a coral colony. So as you can imagine, it's, inc it's an incredibly complex system that we're only now really starting to fully understand. So when we talk about disease, and when we talk about a coral turning white, there are a couple of things that can cause a coral to turn white. These are bleaching, predation, and disease. So if you look at a colony and it's turned completely white, but the tissue is still present, then we're talking about coral bleaching. And while coral bleaching is harmful to the coral, the colony can survive and it can recover. Bleaching usually happens when the water temperature gets too hot, at which point those tiny unicellular algae that live in the coral tissue get kicked out. Now, since the algae are the main source of food, the coral can't survive very long without them. But as soon as the temperature drops, the coral can start to take in new algae and it will recover and usually will survive. If you look at a coral colony and it's completely white and the tissue is not there, then we have two options. The first option is predation. So predation happens when other animals decide that they want to snack on the coral tissue. These can be worms, they can be snails, there are also a variety of fish that will take a bite out of a coral. Think parrotfish uh, or the damselfish and usually you'll see these biting scars. If you take a closer look at the skeleton, you'll see that the structure of it is damaged. So if you see a white skeleton and the structure is damaged, then that is predation. Whereas when we're talking about disease, it also turns white. The skeleton is no longer there, but the structure that the polyps sit into, these little coralites or little cups, are completely intact. That means that the reason that that tissue is gone is because of disease. So to talk a little bit more about disease, and especially disease in the Caribbean. Unfortunately for us, the Caribbean is a hotspot for diseases. There are over 30 recognized coral diseases only in the Caribbean, and the Caribbean accounts for about 70% of all the diseases we know of. For most of these, the causes are unknown because corals are such a complex system. And that also means that there aren't many treatments. Now, diseases can vary in how fast they spread, which species they affect, and also how lethal they are. Some diseases will only affect a few species. Some diseases affect more species. Some of them kill the coral relatively fast. And then some of them, the, disease, the coral will get the disease, but it can happily chug along for a couple more years. And it will generally, it'll survive. It won't be fine, but it'll still be alive. What we have seen in the region is that diseases are becoming more frequent. They're becoming a lot more common. So we know that thermal stress, so warmer waters, pollution, disturbances, unsustainable fishing practices, all of these things increase how frequent diseases appear on our reef, but they also increase how lethal diseases can be and which geograph geographic ranges they occur over. So what we have seen in the Caribbean is that diseases used to be on the reef, but not really that noticeable. And we're getting more and more that over 20% of the corals on any given reef are showing some signs of disease. So the first coral epidemic we had in the Caribbean region was white band disease. And this was really the first disease outbreak that occurred over a large geographic range. So in the 1960s, early 1970s, all of the Caribbean used to be covered by elkhorn and staghorn coral, the Acropras. So if you were to look at our shallow reefs, our reef slopes, and our mid-reefs back then, it would be completely covered by these species. They were the most abundant coral species on our reefs. So what happened in the 1980s was a disease outbreak. We're not exactly sure where this disease came from. We're also not exactly sure what causes it. But what we do know is that after this, during this disease outbreak, between 80 to 98% of all Acropra populations were affected. And now, 40 years later, if you look at our reefs, they haven't recovered. During that time, we know that pollution definitely played a factor. Increasing nutrients in the water column didn't make it any easier on the corals. We had more uh, bleaching events that were becoming more frequent back then. And then, of course, overfishing and other unsustainable fishing practices all made this disease outbreak worse. If we look now, 40 years later after this outbreak, less than 3% of the original population still remain. 
That means that in 40 years, there has been virtually no natural recovery of these populations. This, coupled with the fact that acroporos are a really fast-growing species, is one of the reasons why they are the species most frequently selected for restoration practices. There are so few of these remaining that they are listed by the IUCN as critically endangered. This means they are at risk of going extinct. Now, this was a disease outbreak that really only affected two species. Two very important species, but still only two species. And if we compare it to stony coral tissue loss disease, the story is a lot different. So stony coral tissue loss disease was first detected in Florida, near Miami, in the year 2014. And within one year of being detected, it went from impacting one site to over 130 kilometers of reef in Florida. Unlike the majority of diseases that only affect a couple of species, stony coral tissue loss disease affects over 30 coral species. And a lot of the species it impacts are those really big reef building species. So think of your huge Montastrias, your big Arbicellas, you know, those colonies that are really important to give your reef that foundation that it now is gonna, is a danger of losing. The disease affects different species differently. So some species, are really highly affected, like your pillar corals and your maize corals, and some species are less affected. Luckily for us, acroporos don't seem to be affected by this disease, but the pillar coral that already is not that abundant is now at risk of becoming regionally extinct because of this disease. Now, not only did the disease spread really fast in Florida and impact over 75% of their reef, it also spread throughout the Caribbean, and it did that really fast. So in 2014, the disease was only really seen in Florida. Then in 2018, it was seen in a, lot, a few other places in the Caribbean region. And as of January 2020, the disease is present everywhere you see a red dot. So that means it's impacting almost the entirety of the Caribbean. The latest report we had was that it was confirmed in Ceiba, and there are a couple of suspected cases in Aruba and in Venezuela. That's also the reason why we're having this presentation today, because we need to be aware and informed about what's happening on our reefs. So what does this disease look like? We already know it's fast, and we know that it's deadly. It can kill really large coral colonies within a matter of months. An example of this is this coral colony called the Big Mama. This was a huge coral colony in Florida that contracted the disease and then died in a matter of four months. So this is a colony that was over 330 years old, basically existed before America was a country, and is now dead because of this disease. We know that on a coral colony, the disease will cause multiple wounds where the tissue will be disappearing. So it's kind of like, it's a little bit like if you get a flesh-eating disease, it just eats away at your skin. And then on dive sites, we know that it can spread really rapidly from one coral to the next coral. And the other thing about this disease is it's really, really deadly. If a coral gets it, it has between a 66 to 100% chance, depending on the species, of dying. So as I already mentioned, not all species are equally affected. You have some of them that are more affected and are also more likely to die. So these are your big boulder corals, the pillar corals that we mentioned before, the flower corals. And then you have some species that will get it, and have a better chance of surviving. So think of your bolder star corals and your blushing star corals. Regardless of that, because this disease is so unprecedented, we don't have all the facts. People are working very hard around the clock to figure out what causes it, how we can prevent it, how we can mitigate it, but unfortunately there are still a lot of questions that we don't have answers to. So the first thing everybody asks, of course, is what causes it? And unfortunately, we don't know. We suspect that it's caused by a bacteria because in laboratory trials and what is being done now in places where the reefs have been affected, when you treat the lesions with an antibiotic, amoxicillin, the disease stops. So that means that the wound doesn't get any bigger and the active disease dies off. We don't know exactly which bacteria causes it, but there are two orders or two groups of bacteria, the rhodobacteria and the rhizobacteria, that seem to be more abundant on corals where, that have the disease, in the water in areas that are affected, and in sediment in places that are affected. So if we're talking about how this disease spreads, 
the main way it spreads seems to be just through the water column. So they did uh, aquarium experiments where you would put a healthy coral fragment in an aquarium with a diseased coral fragment not touching each other. And in many cases, the healthy disease, the healthy fragment would also get the disease. So obviously this, uh, this disease is spreading through the water column. We don't know exactly what is transmitting it, but we do know it's going through the water column. They also did experiments where they put a healthy coral fragment and a diseased fragment right next to each other. And in almost all cases, the healthy fragment also got sick and died. So through direct contact, it can also be spread. And then lastly, because we see these, the same bacterial signature in the sediment as we see in the water column and on sick corals, there are hypotheses that it can either spread through the sediment or it can be dormant in the sediment and reemerge at a later date. So how does it spread on a location? If we look at all the places where this disease has been, we see a pattern emerging of large colonies getting infected easier. And that's simply because if you're a bigger colony, you have more surface area coming into contact with the potential, potential pathogen, so you have a, more, a higher chance of getting it. We also know that colonies that are close by are more at risk of getting it. Think of it like if you're in a room with someone that has COVID, your chances of getting COVID are higher, right? Just because you're closer. Whereas if you're further away, then your chances of getting it are lower. Unfortunately for us, it is impossible for, cor for corals to socially distance. And then we know that what your reef looks like, so which species are there, also plays a role in how fast the disease will spread through that reef. However, as I said, most of these studies are being done on an observational basis. So we get the disease and then we go there. The first priority is treating the corals and then the second priority is gathering information. So there are a lot of things that are just still unknown and we can't answer yet. What we do know about this disease, which is incredibly weird, really, talking from a coral disease perspective, is that when there are bleaching events, it moves slower. So most diseases, whenever there is a bleaching event, they get more virulent. They spread faster, you see them occurring more. But for stony coral tissue loss disease, the opposite is true. Whenever it's colder, the disease spreads faster. When it's warmer, it spreads slower. So in Florida, they saw in 2008, 2018, I mean, sorry, that they had a pretty mild year in terms of bleaching. So they didn't have, they didn't have that much bleaching, but the disease spread more and there were more infections. Whereas in 2019, when they had more bleaching because it was warmer, they had slower spread of the uh, disease. They've also looked at the species diversity, so how many different species of corals you have on a site and whether or not that impacts the disease. Because general knowledge will tell you the more diverse your system is, the more resilient it is. But unfortunately, that does not seem to hold true for stony coral tissue loss disease either. Uh, this disease is completely unprecedented. It doesn't follow any of the rules, which are really more recommendations that we know for coral diseases making it a lot harder to tackle it. So if we look at the, um, how it impacts different species, because remember, different species have different vulnerabilities. Some of them are really vulnerable, and some of them are completely unaffected. The pattern of spread is different between species. Unfortunately, it is also different within a species, and it is different by location. So how the lesions appear and how the tissue is lost will vary depending on which coral colony you're talking about, where that coral colony is, and what kind of other colonies are around it. And we don't have, we don't know enough yet to be able to differentiate which factors are playing a larger role. So imagine you get this disease on your reef. You have a couple of options. What do you do about it? The first option is to do nothing. It's not one we talk about often, but it is an option. All the other interventions that I'm going to mention later, we don't know what the impact will be, but we definitely know what the impact of doing nothing is. Doing nothing means you lose a lot of your reef. So after the disease has swept through a reef and the infection rates have fallen down again to kind of the, what they were before the infection began, you will have lost almost all of your highly susceptible species the majority of your medium susceptible species and only a few will remain. Now this might be interesting for coral rescue, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but 
it also means that you've lost a lot of the genetic diversity that there was in your population. So that means the next disease outbreak might just wipe out those few remaining colonies you have. An option that is being tried a lot in the region in places that have the infection is treating your corals with antibiotic. So amoxicillin is a common antibiotic and there ha there's been a, a company has designed a special product called base 2 b that you can mix with the amoxicillin and then apply it on the colony, as you see in the picture. And what this does is it ensures that the majority of the antibiotic is being applied on the, on the coral colony and is not instead leaching into the water column. Because of course, understandably, you know, there are concerns. If we start dosing our waters with antibiotics, what are the impacts of that going to be for other reef species? What are the impacts going to be for coral colonies that would not have been infect, affected? Uh, and it is, it is a legitimate concern. Another option is to mix the amoxicillin with shea butter, apply it on the coral, and then cover it with some clay. Again, ensuring that the majority of the antibiotic is going onto the coral colony itself and not leaching into the water. Some trials are being done right now with probiotic treatments. Anyone who's eaten that can't mention the name of that yogurt, but that's full of probiotics, knows that to balance your gut bacteria helps you feel better and also helps you fight off diseases, allegedly makes you think better. Um, so what they're trying to do is to rebalance the microbiome of the coral. Um, it's promising. It might allow us to target easy better, uh, treat, target our treatments and tailor them specifically to coral species but we're still a long way from home. We don't know if it's gonna work. And then the last thing that is being done in Florida and some other places is just coral rescue. So basically what they do is they go to an area where the disease is emerging and they pull all the healthy colonies out of the water and ship them to aquaria around the country. This is, for obvious reasons, not an option for Bonaire. We don't have aquaria and we have about 27 square kilometers of fringing reef. There is absolutely no way we're going to be able to pull them all out of the water, keep them alive for a couple of years, and then hopefully when we put them back, then the disease has disappeared and they won't get sick again. This is another concern, right? If the disease is being stored in the sediment and you're pulling healthy colonies out of the water that are not being exposed to the disease so are not building up a resistance to it, what's going to happen in 10 years when we put them back? Are they going to survive? Or is the disease going to come back? Again, I don't have an answer. I can't tell you what's gonna happen. So then, what can we do? What can Bonaire do, right? We need to make sure this disease doesn't come here. So whenever we're talking about a disease, there's something that's known as the disease triad. You have the host, or the thing that's gonna get sick, you have the pathogen, the thing that makes it sick, and the environment, which is where the host and the pathogen meet and interact. Now, we can't really do anything about the corals, we can't take them out of the water, we can't change their genetics, they're kind of just there. And the environment, we can do a little bit about that, right? We can make sure that our coral colonies are healthy, that our water is clean, but what is really within our grasp right now is making sure that the pathogen doesn't get here. So for Bonaire, we're really talking about prevention, prevention, and prevention. So one of the first things that comes up when we talk about prevention, and knowing that it's spread through the water column, of course, is ballast water. Now luckily, Bonaire has pretty strong ballast water regulations, and I'm gonna let Judith tell you a little bit more about this. Okay, boats use ballast water to be able um, to balance out the cargo that they transport. Uh, which means that ballast water can be taken out of areas which could be affected with stony coral tissue loss disease. When this happens, we do not want to have, to have that ballast water within our marine park. Um, there are uh, rules, specific rules, which are basically stating that big boats, because mostly big boats use ballast water to uh, balance out the cargo, that they cannot uh, dump water in the, in the marine park uh, and need to do this 16 miles from shore. Um, 
the, um, those rules are being enforced and uh, big boats are aware of those rules. So basically we do not see a threat there. Uh, what could pose a threat is the, the smaller boats, the smaller private boats, which, some, which sometimes also use ballast water to uh, balance out their cargo. And we do think some awareness is needed in this sense to, to make people aware that this ballast water cannot be dumped in the marine park. Um, Stinapo will, of course, work on this. And I'm going to give the presentation back to my colleague Roxanne. <clears throat> right, so that is a little bit about ballast water, and we are taking it into consideration. Uh, another thing to take to be aware of is that because we don't know exactly what transmits the disease, there is a really high risk of it coming in with people who want to come enjoy our Bonaire National Marine Park, right? So think about divers, kite surfers, anybody who's been in the water in an area that's infected, brings their gear in, unaware of the disease without disinfecting it and could be, without their knowledge, transferring the pathogen from wherever they were to Bonaire. So this means that prevention and disinfection is key. Now we have some disinfection protocols that will be in our newsletter, so just subscribe and you'll get those. But what is generally recommended is to soak your gear in a bleach solution for about 10 minutes and then put it in fresh water. You can leave it in for 30 minutes, you can leave it in overnight. This way you ensure that none of the pathogen is attaching itself to your gear and then being transferred to a new site. Uh, you also want to make sure that you don't have any debris, so think sand, rocks, anything that might have attached itself to your gear and then you're bringing it into Bonaire. This is really the most important message of this presentation. We all need to work together to make sure that this disease doesn't come here, that we keep it out of Bonaire's waters for as long as possible because once it's here, there is not a lot we can do, right? Uh, for us, for Bonaire, early detection of this disease is really important. So we need all of you to keep an eye out on your next dives, on your next snorkel, when you go fishing, to, if you see anything that looks suspicious, any suspiciously looking coral that doesn't look quite right, snap a picture of it and we'll try to identify it. There are a lot of resources out there through GCFI, through AGRA, to MPA Connect, that you can use to help you to identify coral, uh, stony coral tissue loss disease. We will put these in our newsletter as well. So if you're interested, you can just subscribe to our newsletter or you can send us an email and we'll gladly send you those. And ideally, if this disease does get to Bonaire, we detect it early enough to where we don't allow it to spread either on that reef, on that coral colony or on that reef, right? We can either treat that colony put that, shut down that site to make sure no one is going there and then picking up the disease there and spreading it to other areas. Uh, we will be working together with other uh, organizations to come up with uh, really good interventions that will work for Bonaire at the scale that we are now. Once this disease is established, there is not a lot you can do, which is the same for everything, right? Once the disease is there, you can't, you can't really eradicate it. So the last thing is that Bonaire, at some point we'll need to talk about a Skittle D action plan. Uh, the sad reality is, or the happy thing for Bonaire is, we have a lot of corals. We have a whole lot of reef. Unfortunately, that means we can't save everything. So we will have to prioritize. What are we gonna save? When are we gonna save it? Uh, who's going to do the treatments? How are we gonna finance it? Even in places where they have buckets of money to throw at this disease, they're struggling with these questions. So it's important for us to start thinking about these right now. Now, I am a biologist, so of course, my first idea is, well, let's save everything. Uh, but my accountant tells me that's not possible. Uh, so we will have to make choices. And how we make these choices will depend on what our goals are. Do we want to save a specific species because it's very rare? Think of the pillar corals. That will mean then our action plan will look different from if we want to save a specific site because it's very diverse and it's very important. Or it will also look different from if we want to save a site that is culturally important or historically important. So these are all questions we'll have to answer. And I can't tell you right now what we have to, which goals we're going to choose, but we do all need to work together to make sure that we keep it out. And if we do get it, that we can act really, really fast and hopefully prevent it from spreading. So now you've heard this presentation, right? And you're all super keen to go out and try to see if you can find a disease. If you do see it, what should you do, 
Well, of course, you want to let us know, let the people at Agra know. They have a whole lot of experts whose only job is to tell you, yes, that is Skittle D, or no, that is not Skittle D. So you can send your pictures to info at agra.org. You can also send them to us and we will follow up. What we do need you to include if you are going out and you're reporting sightings is very importantly, the date, where you saw it, at what depth. If you can tell us a little bit about the coral species that's impacted and a little bit about the site. So are there a lot of endangered corals there or is it mostly sand? Um, that's also very helpful. And, live, and of course, give us your contact info. I cannot emphasize enough that I need to be able to find this coral again. So you need to give me really, really good descriptions of where you found it. So if it's swim 10 meters, then take a left, then take a right at the really big looking, weird looking sponge, that is perfect, because then I can find it. If I can't find it, we can't treat it. Last but not least, there are a whole lot of resources. Again, we will post these for anybody who wants them that you can use to help you identify the coral, the disease. Uh, there are also methodologies that are being used all over the region for how to conduct surveys. Um, not very important for Bonaire right now because we, as far as we know, don't have the disease right now yet. What we do need is for people to let us know if you see something suspicious. If you see something suspicious, send us an email, call us, app us, I don't know, send a pigeon, just let us know. And then we will be able to follow up with this. And the second thing, and the most crucial thing again, is prevention. Everyone coming in needs to disinfect their gear. Uh, luckily for us, we had a whole year almost of complete shutdown, not a lot of tourists coming in, but that's gonna change really soon. And we're gonna get a lot of people coming in from places that possibly have this disease. Um, so we are gonna have to talk with all of our stakeholders and uh, figure out how to prevent the disease from coming in. Preferably everyone coming in just rents their gear here. That way we know it hasn't been anywhere suspicious. Uh, but of course those are not decisions that Stinapa can make and those are also not decisions that we can put on you guys or on the stakeholders. I hope we have informed you enough. I don't know if we have any questions. We don't have any questions. But if you do think of a question later, feel free to contact us and we will answer all your questions. Thank you so much for joining us.